Hello and welcome to the special edition of India Revival Mission by Times Network. We are in conversation with Infosys Chairman, Co-Founder, Aadhaar's Architect, and someone who is indisputably India's top technocrat, Nandan Nilekani. Thank you very much for joining us on ET Now. Uh, this is going to be a wide-ranging conversation, so perhaps I will start with how the economy in India is opening up, um, how tech can really drive inclusion in society before I get to the future of jobs and workplaces. Thank you again for joining us uh, on Times Network. Um, India is finally you know, reaching the end of its lockdown. We're not talking about unlock one. But there is criticism that perhaps the lockdown was too long, too draconian and too early. What do you make of India's response compared to other countries? Well, I think uh, what has happened has happened. And I think now uh, there is a, seems to be a systematic plan of uh, opening up. I think clearly we have to do both lives and livelihoods. And uh, uh, I think there has to be uh, uh, you know, some measures taken at the individual level, like uh, hand washing, masks, and uh, social distancing as well as at the group level by not having uh, big events. But within that, I think uh, we need to look at how to start things all over again. And I think we are on the right track to do that. Right. A anything specific that you can add to that in terms of what was missing so far, what needs to be done? Well, I think uh, uh, I think uh, testing can, can be scaled up. I think, uh, you know, we have largely done testing in the uh, public sector. But we also have, I think, a lot of very uh, quality labs in the country, private labs. And they can, uh, and uh, today, as you know, the Supreme Court upheld the decision uh, for the payment of uh, the private labs from the Ayushman Bharat scheme, which covers half a billion people. And therefore, I think using the private lab ecosystem to increase the testing so that the combined, because we have, everybody has to come together in this situation. So if the combined government and private lab testing goes to several hundred thousand. I think that would make a big difference. The second thing is it's not just testing alone. It's also about uh, contact tra tracing, uh, making sure people go into quarantine, either institutional quarantine or uh, uh, you know home quarantine. It's about all the you know the back end uh, stuff, hospitals, doctors, ventilators, and so on. So I think uh, we need both, but our ability to rapidly identify hotspots and bring them under control is going to be a big part of making this successful. Right. Um, you know, we've also announced, just seen a stimulus package being announced in the last week. Now, some okay. economists, no, we've also seen a stimulus package being, being announced in the last week. Now, some economists we spoke to feel that, you know, this is at best a sedative. It's not going to solve the deep and painful recession that India is headed towards because the total fiscal impact is less than 1% of GDP. Do, do you think more needs to be done to put cash in the hands of people to stimulate demand, get the consumption engine going again? Well, cash in the hands of people uh, is, is always welcome. And we'll talk about DBT perhaps later in this call. But I think, you know, India doesn't have the benefit of a U.S. switch which can run up huge deficits. Uh, you know, in India, if we run up huge deficits, then it leads to uh, challenges on the credit rating, higher cost of global borrowing and all that. So we work within the constraints that we have. So I think uh, uh, that's what the government has done. And uh, whatever we are doing now in terms of cash transfer needs to be well targeted and reach the right people. Right. Uh, the other issue, of course, sir, is about you know, migrant workers, um, Azim Premji recently said that what's happened to them is an unforgivable tragedy, the uh, agony and death of migrant workers. Uh, I want to understand, is there something we can do leveraging technology to ensure that we build a more inclusive society, equitable society to, uh, oh, absolutely. you know, bridge the gaps? No, absolutely. I think uh, one thing we have learned in this uh, uh, unprecedented situation is the need for resilient systems. And, uh, you know, what has, for example, if you look at the uh, Aadhaar enabled cash transfer, that has come out to be extremely resilient. And in the month of April, 150 million people did 400 million transactions to withdraw money from an Aadhaar enabled payment system. Now, this was when banks could not open branches or ATMs were not stocked. You had all these thousands of business correspondents and CSE centers 
and uh, India Post uh, payment bank postmen going around with devices and enabling people to withdraw money from their account just using a biometric authentication. Now that's what resilience is about. And there are five principles uh, for is a resilient system design. First is you need national portability. Whatever you design, a person should be able to access that service or product anywhere in the country. Second, you need choice. He should be able to go to any supplier or any outlet of his choice to get his service. The third is universal, universe, universality, which means that everybody should get access to it. The fourth is convenience. The farmer should get his cash while he's dealing the thing. Uh, old pensioner should get their money at home and so on. And the fifth is it's high volume, low cost population scale systems. So whenever these principles have been done, we have had resilient systems which will work even in this crisis. Right. One uh, initiative that the government seems to be doubling on is the you know one nation one nation one ration, uh, card scheme. This is something that you have been tweeting about as well because the idea originally came from a task force that you headed way back in 2011. Now I read that you know the idea did not uh, find approval then. It was rejected by uh, the NEC led by Sonia Gandhi. Can you take us through what happened then? You know why didn't we have this way back in 2011? Well, you know, the 2011 report which I chaired actually met these five uh, principles of nationwide portability, universality, and so on, uh, which, I, which meant that somebody could uh, migrate from the village to the city and could withdraw his ration there. Or even if he left his family behind, the family could withdraw part of it in their hometown and he could withdraw another part of it in the city. So all this was built in the design of this. But in some sense, I think the idea was ahead of its time. And I think at that time, the need for this mobility, nationwide portability choice was not fully understood. And now it's become apparent that that's something we need. So it's more like sometimes, you know, when you when you plant ideas of reform, uh, they, they take many, many years to fructify. But that's the nature of the beast. Do you in a sense feel vindicated that, you know, something that you worked on in 2011 is sort of finally seeing some uh, function, it's not being wind altogether? Oh yeah, no, no, I think that, you know, uh, many of the things that we worked on delivered results many years later. Aadhaar, of course, is well known, the cash transfers, uh, UPI took seven years to build, uh, the fast tag was designed in 2010, the one, one you know, the, the sort of national portable PDS system was done 10 years back, the GST first report we did in 2010. So basically, one thing you realize in, in public service is that especially when you have uh, large technology-led initiatives, it takes some time and then ultimately we reach a point due to an external event or a, or a leader who understands it and suddenly it takes uh, fruition. So I'm now comfortable with this pace of uh, change in the system. Right. Uh, the other aspect of this is the complexity that this involves. You know, there are over 750 million people uh, who who are eligible for PDS benefits. There are over five black creation shops in the country. So it's going to involve a very complex technology backbone. Um, are we prepared to do this at scale? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at uh, Aadhaar enrollment, we have 35,000 enrollment stations. Today, we have a few hundred thousand BCs. Uh, we have uh, uh, 700 million people who are linked their bank accounts with Aadhaar. So we are used to this population scale. I don't think the scale is any more a challenge. We have done it before in many, many other schemes. And doing it in the PDS is a logical thing to do. And I would also recommend, which is then our original recommendation, that somebody should either be able to withdraw food or cash from the PDS so that he may choose to either take food or he may choose to take money and buy food from the neighborhood store. That again is something that uh, I would still believe in. Is this yet another initiative that you will be working on closely because you know your right. advice has been sought for pretty much every major technology scheme by the government. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm sort of retired from the fray. I'm, I'm chairman of Infosys right now, but <laughs> I'm available for discussions, obviously. But you know, for all practical purposes, you're now like India's uh, default chief technology officer. So no, I, I think I don't agree with that at all. There are a lot of uh, phenomenal people working in the system, uh, who are working day and night to make these systems work. And I played a certain role in a few key systems, four or five of the big ones. And uh, 
I'm, I'm proud that I did that, and I, I, you know, I'm grateful for the privilege of doing that to both the governments that have been involved. So I'm, I'm happy with, you know, with that. So you're not, we're not going to see like a cabinet role for you again for a five-year mm -hmm. time or something. I'm fine. Lockdown in friend. Bangalore, I'm very happy. Okay. Moving on to the business impact of COVID-19. So there, there is no doubt that, you know, over a long-term basis, this could lead to an acceleration of digital economy, lead to a faster shift than we've seen. But obviously, there is a lot of pain in the short term. Every day, we read reports about layoffs um, across industries, be it financial services, media, unicorns, startups. Uh, there is talk about, uh, you know, Infosys also undertaking some kind of restructuring for senior roles. So are things going to get worse before they get better? Is this going to be the trend for at least the next quarter? Well, I think in the short term, yes, it is going to be challenging, and that's what uh, many firms have said. It also this also another example of resilience, uh, Chandra. I think just like I talked about resilience in business system, uh, in government systems, we need resilience in business. And one of the key drivers of resilience in business is is your ability to generate free cash. And uh, you know, what is one of the things we have realized? With the startup ecosystem is that they have always been dependent on raising capital from some VC or the other and uh, what happens is that if that works well when you have liquidity and lots of money and winner take all and blitz scaling and all that stuff but in times like this when uh, you know people are not willing to lay out money uh, then you you really become fragile and you just have a runway of a few months and therefore, you will see a lot of uh, challenges in that area. So I think the ability to build a profitable business that generates free cash is also a sign of resilience. I mean, at Infosys, Infosys generates $2 billion of free cash every year. And while companies are raising money, Infosys was actually able to give a dividend this, this quarter of half a billion dollars. So I think it's important that we think about how we make businesses resilient by generating cash. Do you think this could lead to some kind of change in the way startups have, uh, you know, have operated so far? As you said, it's a very VC-driven uh, model, you know, a growth, a cash burn-driven model. But will this sort of force them to reset and look at a path to profitability? Oh, absolutely. First of all, you know, they, they had built organizations and uh, cash burn meant for a growth of 3x or 5x from where they were. And they went from x to point, you know, point to x or something. And now they just have to get back to X, which was the pre-COVID uh, run rate before they can even think about growing. So this obviously means that to reset a lot of uh, costs and so on. But more importantly, I think the need for profitability uh, has become even more important. And I've, I've written about this even before COVID and it's become all the more important that the great companies of this world in the tech world have always become profitable at very quickly, or, or at least for a few years. But ultimately, when you look at Google or Facebook or Amazon, uh, they, they, they became profitable in five to six years and they, they have huge uh, cash reserves. And you know, if you look at something like ByteDance, ByteDance, you know, does $17 billion of revenue and $3 billion of profit. You know, this is, this is a company which just came up from China in the last, uh, you know, three, four years. Of course, the other Chinese companies are also very profitable. So I think we need to bring back in our businesses the notion that you have to be profitable and that you have to generate cash flow and fund your own destiny. Right. So you speak to a lot of global CEOs. What is the sense that you're getting now? I mean, uh, a lot of people are talking about, you know, a V-shaped recovery, how pent-up demand is going to come back in a big way uh, once we see some kind of treatment or vaccine or herd immunity kicking in. What phase, where are we in this crisis according to you? Are we at the beginning? Are we in the middle? Are we at the day length? Well, I think, uh, you know, some of the things, one thing is that I think we should... Uh, my view is that herd immunity is not going to happen. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, the only thing would be a vaccine. The vaccine will take several months. Till then, we'll have to be careful and cautious about our social engagements and travel and so on. And uh, so I think it will take some time. And we also should not discount the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, another wave of infection uh, post-summer, especially in the West. So I think it's really difficult for anyone to predict thing is to hunker down for companies to hunker down, become more efficient, 
uh, you know, focus on what clients need today and so on. But I think this is also a big opportunity, uh, Chandra, because this is a massive discontinuity in the world economy, much bigger than even the 2008 global financial crisis. And while it will affect many companies, it will also create opportunities for strong companies to become even stronger. But are you bullish about India overall in terms of how we capitalize on this? I mean, we had some grand goals of, you know, 5 trillion and so on. But right now, there is pessimism all around. So what's your overall view? Well, I think there are many opportunities opening up. I think uh, the fact is that India has the potential to em emerge as a viable sourcing option for global companies uh, because there's too much dependence on China and so on. So there are a lot of opportunities opening up. I think the whole services industry has a huge opportunity because what working, working from home has shown is that you can really deliver a lot of these uh, modern services entirely working remotely like you are doing right now. And therefore, I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities. And uh, But it also requires a lot of effort. I agree, it's not that simple to get everything back to a good state. Right. From, you know, the future of jobs to the future of workplaces, uh, TCS believes that it needs only 25% of employees at its campus by 2025. Uh, we spoke to Mr. Narayan Murthy recently, and he said that, you know, this cannot happen unless you set some kind of productivity standards, because even an office employees work for just half the time they are there. What do you make of this? Sir? Is it really going to be pragmatic to have 75% of your staff working for you? Um, in the medium to long term, or is this just you know something that companies are doing now for business continuity? Well, I think it's early to uh, predict exactly what is the steady state equilibrium going to be. I mean, we are in an unusual situation, and there is no question that even when we come to a steady state equilibrium, a certain percentage of employees will be working from home. Now, mm -hmm. whether that is twenty percent or eighty percent, I don't know, and. I personally feel it's a little early to make that call. We'll have to see how it goes. One thing we do know is that everybody should come to office at least some of the time. So it'll be some kind of a rotation. Because you know, ultimately, office is also about social capital. It's about engaging with other people, uh, getting creative ideas, serendipity, building relationships, gossiping, whatever. The point is that we need all that too. And therefore, I think the steady state will be some uh, balance uh, you know, if you ask my opinion, it's more likely to be two thirds in the office, one third at home, where everybody comes to office, you know, at least three days a week. And, uh, the, you know, there's some kind of arrangement where people get seats, which they give up when they are not coming and somebody else takes this, so some stuff. But it's really, I would think, we, I, I would wait and watch and, you know, I think let's get through the next one year, then we can worry about yeah. what happens later. Yeah. I guess there's only so much of water cooler gossip that you can have on Zoom. But um, moving on, sir, this whole crisis has also raised questions about surveillance technology. There are, you know, over 30 countries around the world that have built contact tracing apps for smartphones. India has a centralized app called Arvia Setu. Um, you know, where do you see this going? I mean, is there going to be a trade-off between safety and privacy of individuals or is it something temporary we will sort of go back to normal after this is over? Well, I think, you know, this has really done something which is uh, unimaginable, which is that I now need to know the health of the people I'm meeting. Now, right. you know, that was never never uh, something that you thought about. We thought of health as, as a privacy thing. And now you're saying that unless I know whether the person is, uh, has, you know, he has antibodies or is not suffering or he's taken vaccination, then it's a risk to beat it. So this really puts a whole new angle on, on the whole privacy question and surveillance question. So yes, uh, obviously for a proper containment of this uh, disease, we will have to have uh, more uh, understanding of who's where and what are they doing and whether they're following quarantine and whether they have got antibodies or whatever. But it does run the risk of increasing the state power, and therefore we need to guard against that and treat many of these things as only a temporary step which need to be rolled back once things get back to normal. Right. If I look at the three big ideas that you've driven in the last decade, you know, you have Aadhaar, you have UPI. Um, last year you had RBI giving licenses to account aggregators. What is the next big idea for you going to be in the next 
decade. You know, people are already talking about a national um, health stack. So what's your big idea, the big picture idea for the next decade? Well, well, I think, as I said, I go more by the principles. I, I enunciated five principles, nationwide portability, universality, choice, convenience, and population scale, high volume, low, low cost. And we need to bring that obviously into healthcare. And I think the health stack, iSpirit is involved with that. Health stack is a very important part of that. And I'm glad the government is talking about a health mission. Education is that uh, the Diksha program of the government is now going to get rolled out for distance learning across uh, across the country. And so kids will be able to learn from home. I think uh, voting needs to go to a national uh, voting system. You know, one of the challenges we have had is the vote has not been really portable. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why migrants have not got such a great deal is they can't vote in the cities where they're working. And therefore, you know, they don't have political clout. And therefore having a voter, uh, voter uh, right which I can transfer the day I move from my village to a city is going to be very important. Then I'll be able to vote in the local elections. So I think this whole national portability, convenience, choice, universal universality, and uh, high volume, low cost population scale. We, have, we should apply that to health, education, and uh, you know elections and so on. That will take us 10 years anyway to get it done. So that's a good, good place to start. Right. Coming to the final part of my interview, Bill Gates recently shared a list of, you know, books for summer and the things that he's watching. Uh, if I have to peek into Nandan Nilekani's list, what would they be? Well, you know, I, I'm really more, uh, I don't think I read all that profound stuff which Bill <laughs> talks about. Uh, mine is more, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a news junkie, so I, I listen and watch a lot of news from across the world and I watch a lot of TV shows on you know, Netflix and Prime and Star and all that. That's all. There's nothing intellectually that stimulating. Okay. And uh, if there's a best advice that you've received that you would like to share with people watching this interview, what would that be? The best advice that you've received? Well, I would say this too shall pass. Things will get much better. Use this time to get ready for the next opportunity. Right. So I understand it's your birthday tomorrow. Uh, you're going to be turning 65. I hope I, hope I got your birthday right. Please. That's what Wikipedia says. So uh, as you turn 65, when you look back on the last four decades, um, what do you think is your legacy? Is it Infosys or is it what you've done in the last decade, which is building India's digital infrastructure? Well, you know, I think uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. So I think it's been both working in the private sector at Infosys as well as in the public space through Aadhaar and other things. So that's that's a unique opportunity. And also I think uh, the, what I like is the fact that I've been both able to do it as well as think about it and articulate it through all my books and reports. So doing thinking, doing in public and private sector, I think has been a very good, good experience for me. So after imagining India and your second book, can we expect a third book? Yeah, we are actually working on, I'm working on one now with my co-author Tanuj Bojwani. So is it going to be something related to the post-COVID world or? No, actually the book began pre-COVID, so we'll have to see how it fits into the post-COVID world. Okay, on that note, thank you very much, sir. Wish you a very thank happy you. birthday in advance and take care. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Chandra. Take care. All the best. Keep doing a great job. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.